I'm Nick Hughes, and this is Founders Live Conversations. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Founders Live Conversations. Uh, I am Nick Hughes. I am the CEO and founder of Founders Live. And today, uh, we have a great guest, um, a good friend of mine from Seattle, uh, Sage Kiamno. Uh, she is uh, with Future for us and uh, just a great entrepreneur that has an incredible heart that we are going to learn all about. So Sage, how are you today? Awesome, doing great, just in the hustle. Aloha everybody, nice to, nice to see people on here and excited for this conversation. Awesome. Well Sage, um, before we get really started into uh, the depths and the meat of this conversation, uh, could you please tell us just a little bit about your background, um, you know, just a short, clip of who you are and, and who, who, we're, who we're talking to today. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Aloha. My name is Sage Kilohilani Kiamno. I am the founder and uh, the co-founder of Future for Us, a community uh, platform dedicated to advancing women of color at work through community, culture, and career development. We have over 10,000 women of color professionals, a part of our network, and we provide them resources to advance at work. Uh, we also, um, you know, provide DNI strategy uh, for communities and also companies. Um, and right now, we are focused on just being a community community for women of color professionals, but also our allies. Uh, so, you know, my background is I moved to Seattle seven years ago um, in 2013. I'm, in, I'm native Hawaiian, so moving from Hawaii to Seattle, uh, really just jumped into the tech industry um, and then really focused my time and talent to women's um, organizations because since the 2016 election happened, um, I really wanted to focus on how do we move women forward. And so that kind of spurred me on to and opened my eyes to this entrepreneur journey, uh, knowing that the needs and challenges of women of color in the workplace were really specific and there, there wasn't really a solution or visibility to that. So here we are a year and a half later. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, Sage, I, we go back a little bit and I remember, um, you know, what was your entry into entrepreneurship? I kind of want to talk about first how you and why you decided uh, to really take this leap. But um, I'm trying to remember how we even connected. Was it just, was it just, um, you know, showing up at the events and being in the community there in Seattle? Um, you know, was that, is that how we connected? I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, so I used to work for the Female Founders Alliance and we were often, we were partners to um, Founders Live. And so myself and Alita, uh, Anita Lumba used to uh, attend Founders Live and introduce ourselves and kept coming. And that's how we were introduced to you. Yeah, now I remember. And, yeah. um, you know, why, I, I think the first question is before we really get into, you know, what you're building, um, why entrepreneurship? I always love to ask that of all of our founders, um, you know, sometimes we are the weird ones and, and the weird ones, the world is, <laughs> the world is built by the weird ones and, yeah, and the crazy yeah. ones. And, and so mm -hmm. why, why, cause you're, you're intelligent, you're sharp, you could go work for any company, uh, I believe, uh, but, but why entrepreneurship? Um, because there, there was no other option for me, you know, um, I think as women of color, we often face sector and um, social based isolation when it comes to being in tech in Seattle, um, working at a big tech company. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to thrive in that tech environment, corporation, corporate environment. Um, then also trying startup and being in that startup um, industry from I think about 2014 to 15, 16, and it still had a very toxic environment for women of color to truly thrive. I mean, at that point, it was a very um, tech bro-y uh, environment where, you know, you know, now we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, right? What, is it, what does it mean to create equity for the most marginalized employees? And so I tried, you know, I tried big corporations, I tried startups, then I even tried um, working at nonprofits, and not, you know, uh, I would say mission-driven social impact organizations and still finding that there's deeply rooted white supremacy within in building these companies and also within the um, you know just the just the inner workings of the inf infrastructure and like how do we create better opportunities for women of color because we we face you know we're we're 30 times more likely to be to be questioned on our judgment than our white colleagues um, and so these are really big facts and um, figures when we're talking about 
are we providing, are we creating a, a healthy environment for women of color to thrive? And at that point, you know, I was in my, you know, early mid, mid twenties and it was really, you know, it was really tough for myself. And so trying all these different industries, uh, it really forced me that I need to, I need to create a solution. Um, I am not going to be able to thrive in any of these, uh, any, in any of these companies. So why don't I just start my own company? Women of color are the fastest growing of segment of entrepreneurs per year. Uh, eight out of 10 out of the 10, like, you know, out of the 10% of women um, starting companies, it's no, there's no coincidence to that. You know, there's a mass exodus of women of color leaving corporate environments because of the harassment they, they face, um, or even not being able to get to the C-suite board levels um, at companies. So a lot of us are starting companies uh, because we're forced to, you know, there's, there's, um, we're building technology, we're building companies to solve the problems that we're facing and creating community as we grow, as we grow. So that was my journey through entrepreneurship is that I saw a, I saw a problem and decided to like, to make it happen and just to try and solve it. Right. Well, let's dive into that problem and let's dive into futures for us. So, um, you, you slightly touched on it, but is there like a specific, kind of, I guess, um, metric or problem or issue that you found that was like, got to do this? Like, what problem did you find in the world? Yeah, so women of color only make 3% of um, C-suite level, uh, you know, positions in Fortune 500 companies um, and also SVP companies and only 3% of corporate boards. Um, that is absolutely insane. Um, there is zero, zero black female CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. There's only, I think, two or three women of color Fortune, uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Um, and, and yet we're the fastest growing you know, segment of degree holders per year. Women of color will be the majority in 2060 um, in the workforce. Uh, and we're the most ambitious. You know, there's a report by, it's called the Women in the Workplace Report by um, McKinsey and Lean In. And they said, you know, it, according to their data that women of color in particular, the black women are more ambitious than their white colleagues. And, you know, even in the category of women of color. And, and what we're not seeing is that women of color are not being at the forefront of companies, leading companies. And so that's the problem that I'm trying to solve is, you know, like, how do I, knowing, taking my skill set of being a passionate community builder, a diversity, equity, inclusion advocate, um, my skill set is really bringing folks together and getting resources for them to really truly take control of their careers, um, but also creating a discussion and an educational platform where companies are brought in and they can see and, and you know, it's kind of like an advocacy platform as well is that here's the data, here's the stories for you to care about this. So then what are you going to do and here's here are the here's the experts in the communities willing, you know, for you to really take flight into this, into to dive into diversity, equity, inclusion, and create the solutions that you're looking for, and so that's the problem that I'm trying to solve. And so through community, uh, through future for us is that we have a community platform of women of color. So I'm gathering and cultivating a like a really like just a extreme amount of talent that uh, of a particular group that all these companies are trying to hire right now. And so we created a community of talent. Um, and my goal is to really get more women of color jobs, um, you know, really upscale them and also provide um, career development training for them to from mid career to actually C suite VP level. Uh, but also have these conversations about, you know, what does microaggression look like? How do you navigate workplace politics? And that's what we do so far. And, you know, we've been, um, you know, we've been a company for about a year and a half now. And year two, we've pivoted and, you know, now we're digital. Uh, we've hosted weekly free weekly webinars on career development and hosted a 600 person virtual uh, conference. And so we're really kind of de like developing what are the needs of women of color right now, professionals, uh, women of color at work. So not necessarily entrepreneurs, but women of color at work in corporate environments. Right. And, you know, there's differences there. Uh, there's similarities and differences. Um, but I want to back up and I mean, it's so many, it's so many reasons, but um, why the, I mean, you're right. Those numbers are horrible. I mean, when you look at those numbers, they're, they're atrocious. Why are we there? Or is that an, is that an unfair question? Or like, what's like, what the heck, like, how did we even get here? And then I think at least talking about why can then make more sense on the things that, that you're doing and how we can help. Yeah, I mean, 
systemic racism, <laughs> sexism, patriarchy. <laughs> Those are the things right. that that's literally why we're here, you know, why we are here today. I mean, there's no, <laughs> you know, I think with, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, there's no question why we're here, right? Like it is because of systemic racism and sexism and it's deeply rooted in all of our institutions, right? Inequality um, for folks. And I think, you know, when it, I mean, another stat is that, you know, 80% of jobs filled is through networks, right? And so if you don't have the MBA, if you don't have a Harvard MBA, if you're not, you know, with Stanford, you're only gonna, you're not gonna get to the jobs, the high paying jobs that you're, that you wanna get connected to, right? Um, and so Future for Us solves for that networking, that, 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 that committed network for you to get into these, to these high paying jobs. And so that's where it really is the why, um, you know, it, it stems all the way to education, right? The, we're talking about the education, um, <laughs> the racial wealth gap, right? The education gap, um, then it really moves all into, you know, into college, um, you know, and yet people of color are still, you know, we still exist and we're still, um, you know, we are still resilient in the ways that not only are we exceeding everyone's, you know, um, expectations, uh, you know, really solving for racism and sexism in the workplace. We're creating solutions and we're building companies. We're running for office, et cetera. And so it really stems, it stems like all the way back to in, in history. And I think when you have institutions that have been in power, have been thinking in, in one way and not having the policies in place to create equity for you know mo the most marginalized employees this is what happens is that we're going to keep you know the numbers for all what i'm talking about has changed for 10 years yeah you know 10 years um and and for us it's like well how do we really make create the impact and the change and it is definitely galvanizing a community um to to really solve for that issue but also working with companies from the top down, right? So bottom up, top down um, strategy. So hopefully that breaks it down. I don't want to go into too much of a history. I think everybody can Google and <laughs> can think about what, right. you know, how this is where we are, we are today. But um, yeah, this is, it, it, these are big challenges to face, right? Um, and they're, you know, and they're uncomfortable conversations that be, thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, we have to talk about it. Now there is accountability. Um, and then what are companies? So if you're an entrepreneur in here, um, you know, what are you going to do to create equity within your own company as you start building? Because you don't want to get to a point where you are an Amazon and you, <laughs> you know, you're so big and now you got to backtrack and really, really redefine what, you know, how you create equity. You know, I think everybody on this call or everyone who's watching and you're an entrepreneur is like, how do you start? at the birth of your of your company with equity with in mind right with an equity yeah. lens with diversity equity inclusion at the forefront right um as as important as as your tech team right like just as important as your engineers think about that right imagine if you kept building with diversity equity inclusion as still like as important as your as your engineers um and i think once we have that mindset we'll create better companies that wouldn't have you know these issues right now right like now we see <laughs> like white female uh you know leaders like sofia amaruso you know the co-founder of um the ceo of away you know we're seeing a lot of you know in my industry we call it the feminist industry right um a lot of them are resigning. The CEO of The Wing, um, which is a co female co uh, co-working space, that's social club, right? Um, because they did not create equity for their most marginalized employees um, and they faced harassment, you know? So it, it's important, it's not even important, it's, it's absolutely critical right now for you to think when you, you know, think of, of um, you know, equity when you're building, as you build, you know, I'm taking July off to actually reevaluate my own anti-racism work, but also what, how do we recreate future for us so it, it actually impacts, you know, all women of color, but in particularly black women, black female professionals. So, um, you know, just because I'm a person of color doesn't mean that I know it all, right? We all have our own um, privileges, but also our own ways of our work, our, our work. So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox yeah, on that. No, these, these, are, these are such good thoughts. Um, so maybe some tactical, you just mentioned if you're just starting a business, because that's obviously if you start it in a certain way, you can grow through that. So what would be two or three 
uh, tips or thoughts that you could provide to founders, man, woman, whatever yeah. uh, orientation, whatever background that can start to really build from ground zero in equality and diversity and, and inclusion? Yeah, I mean, it all starts with the founder. So number one is to invest in your own anti-racism journey. Like invest in yourself, right? Like that's why they say, I mean, I know the, um, the guys from an initialized uh, capital, I think um, Alexis Ohanian just left, but they said, you know, if a founders just went to therapy, <laughs> they would be better off, you know, these companies would be better off. And I think a lot of us need to do our own internal work. You know, everything from getting an executive coach to therapy through um, anti-racism work and actually put the time in. You know, I think a lot of us, you know, even when I started, I was like, I got to grind, I got to grind, you know, and I just, you know, you just trying to build and take meetings and da, 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 which is good. But you also need to really parse out the time to really work on yourself, um, your inner work. You know, what are your what is your own unconscious bias? Um, and then you can really identify those, you know, what are, what are things, what are the challenges that you face into your, into, in terms of your leadership style? What is your leadership style? How do you base your decisions? You know, what is your mission and values for your company? Um, so that's my first um, suggestion is to really invest in your anti-racism work. Make the freaking time to do it. I know we're all busy. I know we're all here trying to like, you know, build, you know, huge companies, but like, if we don't, if you don't work on yourself, it's not going to work, right? Because you're you're the leader, um, and so that is um, that's my number one. Um, number two is to um, to really I think really hiring an expert. So really, uh, there's a lot of um, diversity, equity, inclusion consultants out there, um, and whether you you know if you don't have capital, you know talking about some kind of trade, but like again like raise the funds and support. You know there's a lot of black um, diversity, equity, inclusion in, uh, consultants um, and hire them on, you know, hire them on to really help you build out what equity looks like, educate your yourself and your team, um, bring them in, you know, put them on a, you know, put them on a, um, a long term contract, whether it's like three to three to one year, I mean, well, not three, um, six, six months a year. Um, and so then that way you keep yourself accountable on these trainings, but also helping your team grow as well. And then thinking about like, what are the different gaps and holes in your policies, in the way you build your products. Um, you know, I think that's, what, that's what's gonna happen is as you build, there's somebody who's gonna be there to poke holes and, and make sure and hold you accountable that these are ways of you can um, create equity. And here's a way that you're not, right? Like here are the biases that are, you know, are, that are in place in your own company. So I think it's worth the money. It's really worth the money and the time to invest in these things now. Very good. Thank you for those tips. And uh, Anna had a question, uh, I think maybe on one of the areas that you touched on. So Anna, if you would like to take yourself off mute and feel free to ask that question. Okay, um, so um, I mean, my question is very related to what you were just talking. So I have my own startup and I know that just, you know, being Latina is not enough to be like, you know, to be doing a, making an effort toward just having more diversity in the workplace. Um, and it's something that I have been like very, very conscious of just also as being an international student, something that really affects my life. Uh, but what I'm wondering is, you know, like, I guess like for me at this point, like we are pre-revenue, we don't really like, you know, our hiring employees. Um, it's like, where should I be like putting it in like, I guess, more effort to be building this diverse culture? Cause of course, like there are small things that I've been doing. And of course that, uh, like you were saying, and there's like, understanding yourself doing the self-reflection which I think is so important but I believe that there's going to be a point probably in which it's going to be way more important that I am like emphasizing like bringing uh, diversity into the workplace and I was just I just wanted to get some idea of when do you think that that will be and I guess like if any ways that um, I could like approach it from now so when we get to that point um, I don't have to be like just doing a bunch of work for that because I believe it should be something that is from day one. 
Yeah, definitely. Hi, Anna. Thank you for your question and congratulations on all of it. And I'd love to see an international Latina like really create their own company. So that's awesome. Would love to chat with you later. Um, yeah. yeah. So for that, you know, since you're pre-revenue pre-seed, I think right now it's like if you don't and also if you don't have necessarily the funds to like really invest in a DNI consultant is to, you know, what I did <laughs> before I started Future of Us, I was in Seattle for two years just going to every panel, every event. So really dive into the DNI community. Um, there's a community called DNI um, uh, Community of Practice. I can drop a link in later. Or I'll send it to Nick. Um, and that's a really great uh, community of DNI professionals to really keep you on track. You know, they send a really wonderful newsletter every week to talk about topics. Um, and then you really feed, take, you know, take a Sunday for like an hour and just read up upon, you know, what is, what is happening in the DNI um, in the space? What are you know? What are big companies doing? What are smaller companies doing? Um, and I re really get curious, right? Like you know, I think there's the CEO of um, of Remitly, you know, that he's really taking a stance on um, and you know, really protecting immigrant rights, right? And and what does it mean? Um, and I think just being able to to network with these folks um, and get to know these um, diversity, equity, inclusion consultants. Um, offer them stuff that you know support if they need anything you know so for instance if you don't have you know funding for them really build relationships with these communities because once you have them in your network they're going to just be pinging you you know like giving you advice just to help you right and I think um, because you're Latina because you're already passionate and you're you're not you haven't you know built you know a, a product yet it's so good for you to like there's so many resources out there for you um and people will be jumping um jumping on board so i think again we we highly underestimate communities you know i think that's why nick has built a, such a great company and a um, company is because founders live brings entrepreneurs together from across the world um and so for all of us to collaborate hop on these calls like you know you already make the great step of go, go, coming on this call so just going to every panel, uh, webinar, um, you know, asking for their presentations um, is a good first step. And networking with the diversity, equity, inclusion consultants, um, like 101 is another good one. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, uh, thank you, Anna, good, good question. Um, so Sage, I, you know, I would like to kind of go into a little more uh, questions, like just I think the the biases, unconscious bias is 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 really a part of it, like a, the root. Mm -hmm. um, how do we? I mean, you mentioned education and and just starting with yourself and learning, and that's a very very good step. But how do we? Um, I guess there's so many various organization or uh, there's so many identities. I guess is the word to say, uh, individuals that identify in various ways that we, and, and this is not just like the white male, but everyone has unconscious biases. So how do we go about learning about ourselves when there's so many kind of sides to this like uh, thing that, you know, you might say something and it might be offensive to someone that identifies some way that you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that. And that's because there's so many different ways to possibly, you know, um, offend some people in this world. So with that being said, I mean, it's just like, how do we go about diving into and learning about unconscious biases when they're unconscious by nature? Yeah, yeah. I think everyone is deathly afraid to make a mistake, which we get. Yeah. You know, we had co cancer culture is definitely, um, you know, prevalent, right? Especially right now. Um, but I think it's just like all of us need to understand is like give ourselves grace. Um, we're going to make mistakes. You know, we're all going to make mistakes. And it's like it depends on like how are you going to react and how are you going to move forward from that mistake? So right now you need to first analyze your like you have to first analyze yourself and your network. Right. How are you making these decisions? Right. Like I think what we forget is that we have to look like, oh, I'm going to read these books and I'm going to be anti-racist. Right. No, these are all theories. These are all theories that you have to put in practice. So it's starting off with yourself asking, you know, asking yourself, you know, what power do you hold? You know, what decision making power do you hold? Right? Like Nick, for, for example, you have a company and you have access to 
thousands of entrepreneurs across the world, right? You have a platform, you have connections, et cetera. So that is yours. That, that is like one of, one of your many like strengths and like what you, the power that you hold, right? And then two is like, you know, what, you know, when you're making decisions of who gets access to these communities, what entrepreneurs do I, you know, really analyze, like what entrepreneurs that I actually give a lot of resources to or attention to, right? Like how am I basing my decisions on? Um, and, and, and then going from there, right? So like analyzing your, your power, your privilege, what do you have, your, your audit, you know, what, is, what are the things that you have? Like for instance, myself, like, you know, I have a lot of media companies coming from, I mean, media contacts coming from PR. You know, I've worked with a, like national women's organization, so I have contacts from there. So then I analyze that. Then I think about, okay, so who are the people that I'm hiring? Who are the people that I'm giving opportunities to, resources to? Um, you know, uh, who, who am I asking to speak at my conferences since I'm an event-based company? Uh, and, and, you know, really figuring that piece out, right? Like, what is it, what, what power do I hold? Where am I putting that power to? And then who are the most marginalized in my own network? Um, you know, really analyzing who are you hanging out with, right? Like looking about your personal contacts, who are your professional contacts? Who do you talk to more often, you know, most often? Are they from diverse backgrounds? Do they look like you? Um, and it's okay for you to like gravitate for, to, to people, it's natural, right? For you to like, you're, you know, like I'm a one of color. I'm gonna surround myself with one of color, right? It's just a natural thing that all humans have. But like, what does it mean to get comfortable, I mean, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and like really diversifying your networks, right? So like thinking about personally, but also professionally of like, hey, you know, I would love to, you know, like be in other communities, right? Like how do I offer up support to community and, and kind of like build relationships and cultivate um, diverse connections and relationships. So I think that's the, you know, that's your first part of like really thinking about your unconscious bias and it all starts with you but it needs for you, it, you need to do the legwork, you know what I mean? Like for you to analyze your unconscious bias, you need to start from actually analyzing yourself, um, your privilege, your networks, and what, what kind of access to power, who you're giving access to power to, and then, you know, who, thinking about like, who are the most marginalized and how can you support? Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of personal work, right? And this, that's like, that's, <laughs> it's a lot. It's, it's a lot of personal work for all of us to like, you know, one to identify, okay, we're flawed and that's actually normal because that's human. Mm -hmm. Two, okay, I need I need to change and I need to grow. Three, in what areas? Four, yep. what what resources and people and information do I start bringing around me now? Um, and then five, oh, by the way, it's different and difficult, <laughs> like uncomfortable, um, you know, and, and maybe six striking up even opening your mouth and having the conversation to have that uncomfortable conversation i mean that that's all there you know that's the path and and i and i hope that many people i hope all of us can choose that path to to really grow and and better ourselves because in the end you're right it's not only this is this is actually this is society's future you know this is this is our not just our country but our our literally our world's future uh, sits in the balance of we need to bring equality into into focus because it's just getting so much more out of whack. The, the you know economic um, you know the uh, financial economic differences between uh, groups of people is is it's only getting unfortunately the the pandemic has actually put even so much more pressure on that and it's getting worse right now. Oh yeah, um, it's widening it. Yeah, definitely. It's widening definitely. it, and and that's bad. Yeah. Um, and I want to tie that into let's go out. You know, five years. Uh, what would you like to see the world as, and especially with um, you know, future for us, and how you've made helped make an impact on that. Yeah. <laughs> how do what do you want to see in the next five um five years? Yeah. I mean, I mean, radical institutionalized change, right? Like actual shifts, right? Like. People of color, particularly black leaders in leadership, creating change, um, you know, non-black folks, all of us supporting leaders, new leadership, 
Um, future for us being leverage for women of color professionals, giving more women of color um, professionals more jobs, high paying jobs, more resources, networks, and actually being like just the one stop shop for them to really advance in their careers. And so I think this is going to be truly, you know, as the workforce starts growing, where women of color are the majority, um, you know, we're going to need the support that we need um, everywhere from the individual to the companies. And so that's where I really want to see things change. Um, you know, when we're talking about being uncomfortable with looking internally, right, it's like, imagine what, you know, what our black colleagues feel, right, every day, you know, that uncomfortability of walking into a room and you're the only person of color, right, like where you constantly have to be, you know, you have to co constantly code switch and navigate these different certain um, situations where, as in, you know, right now, all of us need to get uncomfortable, right, like now we have to recognize the ugliest part of our country, and <laughs> it's our generation to do so, right? But also like, this is a big, huge learning opportunity because I rather us invest now than later down the line where we're, you know, you know, we're over the hill, right? And things are just not the same. But again, it takes every single person, every single person in our country to, to, um, to galvanize and champion for this because we're not gonna, we're not going to change, right? These are huge systemic issues that needs to be um, championed everywhere within, whether you're startup, corporation, politics, all that, all that good stuff. So again, you know, I, I think it's, it's so imperative now for our future. And, you know, it's, you know, besides the business, right, the business, um, the, you know, the, the, you know, why it's good for business, but also because like just humanity in general, right? Like you want, if you're gonna, if you have kids, or you're gonna have kids, or you know, you 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 just want a better world, you better start thinking about that because um, I, you know, I, it is atrocious what's happening in this country to to black men and women, and we as um, people of power, right? Because we all have privilege in here for us to not have to be working, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, like an essential job right now for us to even have this conversation is a is a great privilege, and still yeah. even starting your own company is a privilege, right? Even I know that, you know, my, my ancestors have got me to this point in my life where I actually can start my own company, raise capital, have these conversations with you, Nick, right? Like native, I'm a native Hawaiian woman, right? Like my ancestors, like, you know, like, you know, the fact that I'm still here and I exist, having a conversation with yourself is a big privilege. And I think again, for all the entrepreneurs to think about your privilege, your position and your power. That's such a, just such a good thought, you know, and, and it's a thought that, you know, reminding ourselves of uh, the privilege of what, what we're actually able to do even right now. And uh, like you said, I mean, it's, um, look, it's, uh, you know, the whole, like, it's good for business is, is the second nature thing. And, and that's natural. Yeah. It should, it should be good for business, but it's, it's really about what's right uh, in the world and in the United States specifically. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, this is a long-term thing for sure, you know, in terms of our movement. Um, I do want to shift a little bit towards, um, you know, you, you've been raising some money. Um, you recently uh, brought on some investment and investor. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, who's involved and then, um, you know, where you see that partnership going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, three months from now, everyone, to be quite honest, I was going to, we were going to dissolve this company, you know, we lost 40% of our expected revenue in Q1 overnight. Um, uh, you know, a, a big portion of our, of our revenue also stream is um, sponsorships, and that was cut in half. Uh, and so a lot of our, you know, and a, a lot of our product, right, is in person events. <laughs> It was like the stack, you know, everything was stacked against us. And then, you know, the government was failing to really provide any <laughs> direction or loans. Um, I, you know, as a one of color, I'm 29 right now. I have no, um, I have no connections at the bank. I have no loan with a bank, right? So like there's already inequities in how you're going to get support <laughs> from the government. So, but as a one of color founder, as any like person of color founder, any founder in general, right? I think it's like, you're so used to this fight or flight mode. Um, and I'm just giving you the context to this question is that like, here was my stats, right? Like, here's what I was facing. Um, and so I needed to do something. And, and basically what I did was I applied to every single grant. So I applied to over a hundred grants um, for small businesses, startups, et cetera. Um, and I also applied for the loans. 
uh, luckily I won three grants in 30 days. Um, I secured over like 100K in like sponsorship dollars from other companies who believed in us. Um, and so I think right now, how much is it? Yeah, like I think $150,000 in grant money. Um, and like thinking about right. it this way, like, <laughs> like I am pitching myself with thousands of other small business owners and startup founders. Um, because, and then I also was very visible. I was very honest and transparent about my journey. Like, Hey, this is a, this is what COVID-19 did for our business. I wrote a blog. I also, um, listed out all the grants that I, um, applied for and I promoted it. So not only was I, you know, like applying, but I was I also wanted to make sure that window color entrepreneurs are also applying. Um, that got picked up by POC and tech, which is a, a UK based uh, media company. Um, and then Vital Voices, um, a global nonprofit, I'm a leadership uh, fellow from them. Uh, they helped help me secure um, these grants. Um, and I also, you know, which, um, we won a $10,000 grant with Serena Williams. And so Serena Williams is a part of our, you know, a part of our, um, our journey. And really, you know, she believes in equity for women of color, especially when it comes to pay and their careers. Um, you know, she's a mother and she's really focused on that as well. Um, her husband, Alexis Ohanian, also a big um, <laughs> tech founder and, and entrepreneur who's, you know, if you want to, if the men in here and also the, I mean, obviously the women as well, like if you really want to know how to be an ally, like that is a person to really follow. You know, the fact that he left um, the Reddit board and to, and also made sure that they put on a, you know, a black leader to replace him. Um, he's really, I mean, what does it mean to lose power, right? <laughs> like how do, what does it mean to give up power for, for equity? And I think that's what's really, I mean, that's what makes people uncomfortable, right? Like, what is it, what does it mean to do that? And so that's kind of my journey is that, you know, we won, you know, three grants, one of them from Serena Williams that has helped us increase our community by 10%, um, our social media engagement, our newsletter subscribers. And now because of we uh, you know, we really secure this funding, I can really in reinvest into the tech platform that I'm rebuilding. Um, um, I can invest in my own anti-racism work and build out for the next, you know, one or two years. Um, and now, you know, and all, all in three, in all in three months or so. Um, so when people think it's impossible, it's possible. I mean, obviously <laughs> it wasn't easy. Um, and it took a lot of, it took a lot of nights and a lot of, you know, I think for me, it's like anger, what's really, <laughs> what really drives me. So figure out like what really, what really drives you to execute. Um, and so that frustration it made me execute pitch and refined it. And every failure and success that led me up to this point has, has, has made me successful. And right now, yeah. so every failure yeah. for the last two and a half, I mean, one and a half years, you know, getting rejected a thousand times, people saying like, I don't get it. Why do we need to have a community for women of color, blah, blah, blah. Um, that, you know, those rejections made me a better pitcher, a better entrepreneur um, and a presenter. And so that really, really geared me up to pitch hundred plus companies, a hundred plus grant, you know, grant writers, et cetera. So, you know, I'm really excited for Serena Williams to be on, you know, I'm hoping to work with her. I want another grant from Bumble. So Bumble, I mean, a lot of people know what Bumble is. And, you know, she, uh, Whitney, who is the CEO and founder, she also is investing a lot into female entrepreneurship, tech platforms. And so, you know, and Serena Williams and her, they also are um, investors in, in each other. So I'm really excited for the next generation of, um, you know, career development platforms for, for women. And also, what does it mean to be a women-led organization? Um, focus on gender, but also um, intersectionality. Right, that's uh, an amazing, amazing journey. Even in the last three months, um, I'm going to pause here. Um, and if you know e any one of you have a question, I'm sure you're thinking it. Uh, please uh, jump in here if you want. Um, my question is, Sage, a, a, a kind of follow on to what you just said, which is, if you could sum up the this the uh, pandemic and the way it's hit this world and then basically you were like you know you know because our businesses are s similar in some ways and so we got hit too so i experienced what you were feeling um how has it really impacted you and and how has it permanently changed you as an entrepreneur and maybe even like 
double down on your vision and passion, but like, just walk us yeah. through that experience, you know? Ooh, yeah. I mean, it, it woke me up for sure. Right. It really made me analyze my own self as a leader. Um, it really was like, here's the ugly stuff about you. Here are the good things and you better start investing into yourself. Right. I think, um, Luckily, future for us, you know, we all things considered with no business plan, with no, you know, Harvard MBA, we did pretty well for ourselves, you know, and I think a lot of startup entrepreneurs who are a little farther on would say success hides failures, right? Like success hides failures. And we were pretty successful early on, um, but we were go, go, go. We did this, we did that. You know, there was a lot of spaghetti on the wall, but like with no really strategy, right? Um, and cause we just wanted to build a brand. We wanted to build a community pretty quickly. Um, and so we were on the road, we were doing things right. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, once you have like all these opportunities coming to you, right. You just, you know, I'm an opp opportunist through and through and you're just taking them, you're just making it happen. But when you're, when you're doing that, you don't have the time to really slow down, you know, evaluate, um, and really take, you know, take into consideration, like, are you actually impacting the the people that you know your consumers your clients or you know the people that you're you decide to impact right what is your mission are you actually following your mission and i think um you know and it forces i mean a lot of you know i think for a lot of entrepreneurs it has forced you in an uncomfortable all the things that you didn't want to do you had to do right <laughs> so, like i you know i'm not you know I, I i do love technology but i wouldn't say i'm not a tech like i'm not a product manager right i don't really i didn't I wasn't, I was moving really slow and like creating like a online community because I wanted to do my research. I didn't have time to. And then all of a sudden it's like, here's COVID-19. You're going to have to do all, everything digital. You better figure out every single tech platform. You better be an expert at this. You better figure out, you know, so it's like, it really forces you to like focus on the things that you were ignoring, but you had to do anyways, but also it really forced me to really analyze myself as a leader, right? Like, are you creating equity in all parts of your company, who you're hiring, who you're serving, who are you giving the resources, who you are um, asking to speak for things. And um, it was a rude awakening. I mean, that's why I'm taking off in July, right? Like I am actually taking it off, right? Like I am going to be um, really thinking inwardly, doing some strategy about how can I create a better company? How are we going to pivot even more? Uh, and how are we going to make sure that this is going to be a sustainable business model in the next two to three years, five years. And so, um, you know, I think this pandemic has really made us take a pause and look inwardly um, and analyze our leadership because we've seen poor leadership in every oh. institution. And so now we know, you know, that's the beautiful part about us being like, you know, like early stage startup career, I mean, you know, startup founders is that like, this is your time to like grow, learn from it and be better. Better, right I think there's a bit there's a really good graphic on Twitter about um, you know the bit the largest tech startups um, largest successful tech startups all came after the um, during the recession right because they were solving problems at that time and I think how exciting is that right like you get to build the future right now and learn from the mistakes from you know from other people that that, that you see exposed um, and I think this is a really great opportunity, but also your own personal growth as a leader. Like we should yeah. all want to be better leaders. You know, I do, you know, and it's really, um, but it's, it takes the vulnerability part, right? It takes the vulnerability of like, oh man, like I've done this mistake before, you know, we weren't really hitting our, you know, our mission and, you know, re, you know, yeah, like it takes that uncomfortability and being vulnerable, but like Brene Brown, right? She, one of our famous Ted talks is like, that's a strength you know, figure out your, your holes in your company now and start building up and creating the time for that too. Yep. It's, uh, I th really been provided to us a time to pause, um, yeah. reevaluate. And, and I think the last thing I would add to that is, um, the world changed and, and it is changing. And, mm -hmm. and I think like the, the, the beauty that we have is smaller, uh, companies and brands is, you know, we can reorient and absolutely go towards the future where the yeah. larger companies are like, they're kind of backpedaling and trying to like yeah. figure that out. Um, so we're you know, more I, nimble. We we're more nimble. nimble. Yeah. Yeah. Nimble, agile. And yeah, of course, I mean, just being able to, um, 
more quickly shift to understand, well, first of all, you got to understand what this new world is at least shifting towards and then, and then making that change. And, and I think that that's, that's really good, but I want to bring in Allison. Um, so Allison has a comment and a question ish, I guess. Uh, but, uh, Allison, why don't you take yourself off mute and, you know, say hi. So I'm not a D, like a yeah, diverse, diversity and equality um, inclusion kind of consultant, but I am an, I have a degree in industrial organizational psychology, and that's definitely mm -hmm. one of the things we talk about. And last week I shared a, um, it was a article talking about like if companies want to really change and involve more, you know, bring in more, you know, to change how you know the system racism that's going on there's so much that needs to be done I do think that smaller companies are a great spot where they can just start looking at like how they're hiring um, how they're like where their perks are giving out if you think about most benefits most perks they're, they're geared towards the majority which that's not gonna that won't include more diversity also you gotta look at the culture fit people that hire for culture fits is not typically hiring for diversity and I really think that companies need to get away from that. And if you're going to do that early on, it's probably easier to get that get done. And like, when you, what messages are you sending out to, to your candidates? Um, what things are you doing to attract people of color? And I think there's so many things that can be done. But definitely, as a smaller company, you know, it's easier to get a start now. Where the big companies, like they have huge problems. Like it's so embedded in everything they do, but I just am definitely a strong proponent of diversity. Um, the last three hires that I helped make were actually all black women. And companies sometimes are like, yeah, we want to have more diversity in our companies. It's good for innovation. And I'm a big proponent of it. So I'm really, I love what you're doing. So keep it up. Let me know if there's anything I can do to help. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Allison. And I know that uh, Sage has put her, actually, you know, a few more people have joined in. So um, Sage, could you just shoot your LinkedIn um, link one more time in the comments? So if anyone wants to, yeah, there you go. Um, for those of you who have joined uh, in the last few minutes, uh, we don't have too much time left, um, but we're talking with Sage. Um, her organization is a Future For Us. We've had a great conversation around, you know, I, you know, diversity, inclusion, and and really, um, the 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 areas that that they are building around, um, you know, I you know, Sage, I think um, to end this, uh, you know, let's maybe take a little step back uh, in terms of um, the focus and just even just founders in general, uh, from a standpoint of kind of no matter what they're building, uh, what what advice would you have? what advice would you give to, you know, early stage founders that are, you know, um, either in the idea stage or just getting going and they really want to start building out their company and their vision, you know, what things pop out that you would give advice to early stage entrepreneurs? Yeah. I mean, there's a big quote that I live by, by Arlen Hamilton. She's the CEO and managing partner of Backstage Capital. Um, her VC fund primarily funds uh, POC startups, POC led startups. And so she says, you know, be a key maker, not a gatekeeper. So what does it mean to actually be a key maker and continuously open doors and keys for other folks, right? I think that's such a big legacy um, quote. And that's a simple way of when you are building new products, when you are building your company, your policies, hiring practices, retaining, you know, retaining practices, all that, you know, all that stuff. Thinking about how am I being a key maker, right? Like, what does it mean to be a key maker? And so leading with that quote, you know, if you're an early stage entrepreneur, do your research, like get out there, go to every single diversity, equity, inclusion panel, network with these folks, who are the experts doing it, analyzing what big companies are doing for that, for creating equity, who are creating equity, who, you know, who are the startups who are doing that as well, going public with that, um, you know, and also get curious about, you know, even like thinking about like brands, you know, like PR companies and marketing companies, how are they positioning it? Um, analyzing campaigns um, and then doing that external research, you know, what, what is out there, uh, but also doing your own research for internal, right? Analyzing your privilege, your power, your position. What, what, what kind of power do you have in decision making? 
Um, and then what are you going to do to create equity in your own space? So I think a lot of the research, a lot of um, in, inward eternal work, and then also what is applying, what is the, what is the, what is the solution, right? So how are you going to take the theories that you learn and then actually put them into practice? Do you need support with that? Do you need an accountability group? Are you going to have other folks, you know, like, you know, maybe it is joining a cohort, right? There's so much, there's so much support for entrepreneurs right now. Like join an accelerator program, join, you know, join a cohort that's going to support you on this because I think you don't have to go this alone. I mean, that's the biggest, you know, value proposition that Nick has with your company, right? It's like, we realize that like this stuff is hard. Not only are we, you know, we are taking the biggest jump of like, you know, actually starting a company and doing this and it is lonely. So what does it mean to like be a part of a community that holds you accountable and that you can collaborate where it's a safe space for you to make mistakes too. Like, Hey, I thought about this idea, but like, can you challenge me on this? Right. Um, so th these are the different steps that I really highly recommend for any early stage entrepreneur. Cause that's what I've been doing. Um, and it's checks and balances, checks and balances. I think that's what we forget is that, you know, we all get some kind of stardom. Um, you know, there's the glorified CEO and founder of something, right? Uh, and, you know, you need <laughs> the good people who's going to check you um, yeah. and really make sure that you're held accountable. Um, but also, you know, you need to really analyze your ego. Um, where does that come from? Your insecurities, where does that come from? Um, and I think that's what a lot of us need to, as leaders, need to analyze. Um, wow. And then also mirror that, mirror the be the example that you want to see right in the world um, and truly believe in it. Yeah, those are great thoughts. Uh, one thing that just jumped in my mind was, um, and I say this a lot to founders, just like momentum is your best friend as, as a founder in, in your company and momentum can be created in various ways, but you want those small wins and small wins can be like great conversations, you know, with a, or a good coffee meeting with a potential partner uh, maybe a potential, um, you know, hire, or uh, in the end, maybe you're onboarding a new, uh, you know, uh, customer or, you know, sponsor or investor. But, um, you know, the little wins are like, they're absolutely what you need as an entrepreneur early on to build. And then it builds confidence. And then confidence leads to more wins and maybe bigger wins. And, and the whole thing just is a magnet. Uh, so, you know, anyone out there that's just getting started, you know, you know, figure out what those little wins can be for you. Uh, just some of the things that Sage just mentioned. And, and I think that, that you're on the right path. Uh, we only have a few more minutes uh, to the top of the hour. Uh, those of you that joined in a little late, um, we have opened up the, op you know, the opportunity to ask Sage any questions. So if any one of, any one of you want to jump in and, you know, say anything, the floor is open for the next few minutes. Um, so feel free to either unmute yourself, say hi, message in the chat, but we, we're going to close up here at the top of the hour. So I want to give you an opportunity to uh, say anything or ask a question if you would like. Um, so I just quickly wanted to ask um, to Sage, when you are in a situation in your workplace in which you realize that there is some type of unconscious bias, which a lot of the times uh, I can speak just as being a woman, sometimes it, not sometimes, but very often it does happen. How do you deal with those? Um, so like, for example, if the, if the bias is against you as a woman, right? So you're receiving this treatment that is different. How do you approach the situation? Because a lot of the times to just go into the person and be like, hey, like, you know, you're, you would be talking differently if it was a man. It can, like, people have, I've been in a situation which, which the person has been, like, offended and, like, oh, like, are you saying that I'm sexist? So um, how do you approach situations like this in which, you know, like, you have a positive impact rather than just create kind of a conflict there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's what, I, I mean, it, it's all particular, I mean, it's all different in particular situations, right? It's, like, first analyzing who's in the position of power, um, and then how are you going to actually get the results that you want, right? And what it really means is like asking the question, right? Like, I think when you're, you know, you're asking the aggressor, I would say, like when you're asking that person, hey, you know, would you say something like this, you know, if I was a woman, like, if you turn to them and ask them questions, they, you, it's like leading the camel to the water, right? Like you ask the questions for them to really analyze, like, 
oh, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do, right? And, you know, um, and also like really approaching your, um, really think about the situation um, ask your manager, if this is your manager, um, then, you know, talk to them, talk to their, up, you know, whoever their skip is or whatever and say, hey, this is what I've encountered. We'd love to discuss this. If you feel safe to talking to your HR, I mean, most people say don't talk to your HR, but like, if you feel safe to talking to your HR about it, this is what it happened. Um, really consulting with your, e if you have an ERG group within your, your, your company, like a women's ERG group to talk about it in terms of like, because sometimes they would, depending on your position right in the company sometimes they have a better eyesight of like who can actually make decisions on on that on that situation um and then again too like really fighting on unconscious bias training within your company um and saying hey like i don't want this to happen to somebody else i want this is this is systemic so can i you know let's pitch a unconscious bias training through our erg group etc um and again like i can send you there's a I'll send you a link to uh, a workshop coming up called like um, how do you deal with microaggressions in the workplace um, and and so that's another a great resource for you I'm not an expert but those are the ways that I can tell you depending on your comfortability and your position of power where you where you can go and how you can approach it that's to me how you can approach it but I don't again <laughs> I don't want to give you advice and you're like ah um, but these are, the, these are different avenues experience. yeah Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So those are the different approaches that you can take is that either you, you know, you work one on one with this person, ask them questions to make them really analyze their behavior. Two is to like approach their skip or the person that managed them. Three is to like thinking about how can I talk to this with my HR manager. And then four is to like talk to your like women's ERG group or anybody who leads like this kind of work um, to pitch for a diver like for um microaggression training or unconscious bias training from the leadership. Um, and so those are kind of four different approaches. Uh, but if you're trying to deal with them one on one is to like ask them the questions and then lead them to the way of like, hey, this isn't, this is not right. Trust me, I had a white male co I mean, boss who was like, hey, don't you want to be the coffee diva today? And I'm like, no, oh, dude, I do not want to be the coffee diva today. There's literally Dan, Dick and freaking Charles over there aren't doing anything. Why are you calling me the coffee diva today? Okay. So like, you know, for me, when I was approached with that microaggression, I actually set up a one-on-one -on -one with my boss and said, Hey, you know, would you ask Dan to be the coffee diva today? Like verbatim, would you talk to him like that? You know? And so that really made him think, you know, I didn't think he was thinking like it will. Right. But really thinking about, you know, standing as self advocating for yourself, leading them and asking the questions of why that behavior was like wrong but also making sure that like you're not okay with it and this is why it's not fair so that's an example how i used it anyways as i hope that answers your question anna oh it does it does and oh, i would love yeah. uh, it's, i to get also the link to the event about microaggressions cool. um i'd love to share that with my friends as well sweet yeah i will do that um but thank you so much yeah, of course. Uh, here, you can join our closed um, LinkedIn group. And we'll have everything there. Sweet. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Anna. And, you know, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, and specifically, thank you, Sage. Uh, this has been such a great conversation. And, you know, these are the, these are the types of conversations that we love to, to really organize for Founders Live. And, uh, inspiring, educational, and and just just so great. So, thank you all. This is, yeah, thank you. This has been Founders Live Conversations and Sage. Um, hopefully, it's not too long in the future that we see each other in person again. Jeez. I I know Cherry Street. It, wait, what is this <laughs> Cherry Street Coffee Shop on First Man? Yeah, I Got, know. Yeah. So, um, hopefully, it's not too long before that. Um, but thank you so much. Uh, good to see you, and good luck with everything. We're here for you. Uh, so let's stay in touch. Sweet. Thank you, everyone. Join our subscribe to our newsletter. Be a part of our community. Um, you know, we, we're open for everyone. So win of color, but also our allies. And again, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye.